Uh, it's kind of weirdly spelled, but that's how that's the pronunciation. It's Augie Maciel. I'm a senior manager of quality engineering at Red Hat. For the last six plus years, almost seven years now, I've been building quality engineering teams responsible for testing, automating tests for uh, several different products at Red Hat. You can see some of them listed here, such as Red Hat Satellite, uh, the Pole Project, which is an upstream project, Ansible Tower. Um, and I would like to talk to you today about doing web UI automation, specifically using Selenium and Python. You probably noticed that the, I don't have a slide, so I'm actually using a web page to show you the data. There's a reason why I chose to do that and not actually have slides. For one thing, you can follow along, so you can either clone the Git repository that's right there on the site. You can visit that page, which is devconfusa18.readthedocs.io. And the reason why I uh, decided to do this is because DevConf, the whole idea about DevConf is about open source, right? So sharing, um, really trying to collaborate with other people. So a couple of things that you get out of if you were to clone this Git repository. For one thing, you're going to have all the, uh, sor the source code for the document itself. Um, I know that sometimes people have to write documents and they want to use maybe something that is easy for you to script against or write code. So restructured text is what I've used here. It's, it can be a little bit daunting and scary to write anything using restructured text. So if anything, if you don't want to do any anything related to automation, you don't want to know about Python or anything, at least you can use this to say, well, this is how you build a document with images and tables and links and that stuff. So um, I'm hoping that you will though, um, want to do automation and want to use Python and Selenium. But this is one of the things you can get out of. Uh, the other thing thing that I want to also uh, point out is that I am going to try to cover as much as I can in about 30 minutes. That's a lot to unpack, so I'll do my best. But once again, if you clone this repository, if you just bookmark this page, um, you would actually get access to all the configuration files that I'm using here. I'm going to show you how to automate stuff using Python. I'm going to show you how to use PyTest. And then I am actually also going to show you how to plug it all in into a continuous integration, continuous delivery environment. So what's in uh, this whole thing for you? Why am I taking so much time of the 30 minutes that I have to talk about this? Is that I interview people a lot um, for jobs. And a lot of times they don't have, they, they come in and they say, well, I've done this, I read this, or I studied this in college, but I don't have anything to show for. If you take this, and you start modifying it, at least you have some kind of pro, um, uh, portfolio that you can bring into your interviews and say, I know how to write tests. I know how to use PyTest. I know how to use continuous integration. So I think that you know ultimately you could use this to hopefully get your next position or you know at least to brush up on, on your skills right now. And the true sense, the true spirit of open source, uh, what I do ask is that if you make any changes and if you make any improvements, please send me a patch. I will apply it, I will give you credit for it, and then you can help me improve the document for anyone else who wants to use it. Okay, so there's a lot, like I said, that I want to unpack here. Um, but when we talk about web UI automation, your job as a quality engineer or as a tester is to actually try to identify the things there are, the elements that are on the web page so that you can interact with it. And I'm not going to lie to you, web UI automation is a pain in the butt. It's, it's hard, um, especially I would say that writing good, robust web UI tests is really hard to do that because you have to, I'm going to show you this little picture here, this is a, a DOM object. You can think of a, of a web page as a um, two ways that you can interact with a web page. You can look at the source code for it, which is the HTML, or you can think of it as a tree representation where you have this DOM object, and you can see that you have the top node that represents the entire web page that you're working on, and then for each node that you see here, it either represents a section of the page or an element that you want to interact with. 
So why is it such a pain to, to actually do web UI automation? Is that a lot of times designers and the developers, they will change the look and feel of the page. And depending on how you choose, I'm gonna show you some of the schemes, some strategies for you to identify the elements here. Um, depending on which strategy you choose, if you're relying on an element to be on this node here, so it's like two nodes deep, well three nodes deep, and you build your strategy around uh, something called XPath, if that element moves to another node, then your code is broken. The XPath expression that you're gonna write is just is, is completely useless, right? So you, have, you find yourself continuously having to rewrite your expressions, your strategy. The other thing that is also, um, I, I guess I should point out, it's not really, um, may, it may not be obvious, but the whole point is you want to automate. And computers are much faster than the human beings. So a lot of times when you work on a web page, people put like a lot of you know Ajaxy things, and there's a bunch of JavaScript uh, uh, frameworks that people are using there. So sometimes you have to say, you know, when you're devising your test, I'm going to click on something. Something is going to happen. I need to make sure that my code is smart enough to wait for that one thing that I'm expecting to happen. So it's really an art. It's a pain in the butt. So my advice is that try to keep it to you know, keep your tasks, UI automation, as few as possible. Make them robust. Make them cover um, as much ground as you can to, like, for integration tests. Uh, unless your job is actually to do web UI automation, I guess at that point you don't have much of a choice. But you can, the way they integrate, interact with the elements and the elements like buttons, menus, uh, images and whatnot is to find uh, a locator. And if you were here earlier for Anisha's talk, she was talking about how you can look at the source code, for example, of a web page. And this is the, you know, Google's search box there. I am highlighting the, the specifically the search box because in there I can look at information that I can use. Um, right now, it's, what I have highlighted here is the ID of the box, which is LST-IB. And that's going to be uh, something that I'm going to be using for, for the demo here. So you can search for things by text, which is what I recommend. Then you can search for things by um, their CSS IDs or CSS values, and that's the, the list that I have here. And tag names, the HTML tag names. I put XPath as the last option here because I'm trying to encourage people not to use it. And the reason why is, you know, for, for one thing, it's pretty fragile. If things move around, then your XPath changes, um, and then you break a test. But some XPath expressions are evil. They're really, really hard to understand. So like this example here, because I don't have a good way to get a hold of the element that I want, I need to find an element and then walk backwards to find the one that I wanted because there was no clear way, direct way for me to get to the element that I wanted to, um, to get to. So that's my, my advice. So Selenium is the framework that a lot of people use. So Anisha talked about Protacker and Jasmine earlier today, but Selenium is the one that I'm really used to, and I think it seems to predominate around like people who are doing web UI automation. But it works on it works on different platforms. It's open source, which is pretty cool, and it also has uh, bindings for several different programming languages. We're going to be talking about Python today, but it does offer bindings for uh, other languages, and you require what you do is you install the Selenium um, uh, application, the framework itself the, for your system, and then it provides you with a domain-specific language that gives you helper methods to interact with the web elements. So it lets you click on things, select things, scroll through the web page, uh, really control like the elements of the web page. And in addition to Selenium, you need something called a web driver, which lets you interface with, the, with the, an actual browser. Okay, so Firefox, Chrome, uh, Microsoft Edge, Safari, or anything like that. So you need the combination of those two to actually do web UI automation. One easy way that used to be a really nice uh, tool, and it's still there is, but it's changed a little bit, is Selenium ID. And it's an add-on that you install on your, on your browser. The old version was, in my opinion, was a little bit easier. It provided a little more value but it was a pain to install. It required an older version of Firefox. 
the, one of the advantages of it is that the Selenium ID lets you record your interaction. So you, you turn it on and you start clicking away and, and typing stuff and moving things around the web UI. It records every step of the way, everything that you've done. And then when you're done, you can just replay it. And you could literally say, this is my automation, though I wouldn't go as far to say that that's automation. But, but you could literally do that, right? So um, the other advantage that the old version of the Selenium ID ha had it was that it let you um, export things um, into different languages. So all the actions use the language, the domain-specific language, click, select, go, get, stuff like that. But then he translated that into Python. So now you're really closer to having full automation because you could just use this thing and then record it, export it, and add your Python code. And then you were done. The new version, which is what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen there, it actually, uh, there are good things about it and the bad things. Uh, the good things is that it's a whole, it's really easy to install. So if you have the latest version of Firefox, or now it supports Chrome, so what, whichever browser you have, you can just install it through the add-ons page, and there's nothing else for you to do. So that's pretty cool. The bad things about the new version is that they removed all the bells and whistles that they had, and one of them is not being able to export to Python. So that kind of stinks. But what I want to show you here is that, you know, just to give you an idea of what Web UI automation really is all about. So I'm going to hit the record button here. And now I'm just going to give you um, an example of going to uh, google.com. And then I'm going to click here on the search box. On the right-hand side, you can see that there are some two, two steps. Two commands were executed and recorded. There's an open slash. Slash is the root um, address that I typed right here, so google.com. It says that I clicked at something that has an ID equals to lst-ib. If you remember the, screen, the screenshot that I showed before, that's the Google search box. Now I am going to you know, type some text, so I'm going to... I'm going to search for Red Hat, and then I'm going to hit the search button, and it performed the search, right? All the steps were recorded on the right-hand side. So if I stop recording now, I can change the speed. Let me make it, because this goes really fast, and it goes back to what I said about computers being really fast. But I can replay this, and what you should see now is that it's going to open Google. It's going to type Red Hat in the search box. It's going to hit the Google search button, and you know it's, um, it's going to display the list. So I'm running really slowly here for you guys to see it, right, all the steps of the way. But this is, I guess, an example of the Y automation. Right? So it's too bad that the new version of the ID has changed, but um, I highly recommend it to play around. See, see if you like it. It gives you good ideas. Um, as, you as you are recording your actions, you can actually right-click on the browser, and it adds a, a um, extra menu option that gives you things. For example, you want to say, um, you know, verify that a certain text is present, verify that a certain field is present before you move on to the next thing, or assert that the thing that I'm looking for is there. So you can see all of that exposed through the, um, uh, the interface. So trying to move really quickly here, um, Selenium ID is a really nice tool. Um, I hope that you read through the web page and there's some points there to talk about advantages and disadvantages of it. <laughs> Sirocco is another one. It's the same exact thing. It does the same exact thing as Selenium ID, but it's for Chrome only. Um, it doesn't really give you the same, I guess, the same experience Selenium ID does, but it's still there. Now the Selenium ID supports Chrome. I would recommend you to use Selenium ID just to play around. But the real magic happens when you start automating things using Python or some other programming language, right? Because now we have really full control over it. And the idea here is, as I mentioned earlier, um, you want to use the Selenium module. It exposes a lot of different methods. And these, in my opinion, they're very intuitive because the name of the method tells you exactly what you're trying to accomplish. So find element by ID, find element by XPath, and then you know, it should be very intuitive what you're, what you're attempting to do.
And I would say that most methods are named in such a way that are very easy to follow along. Right? So you can see, for example, here are some fragments of HTML. And this is the, this box here in the bottom. You can see this is how you would use Selenium to access something by ID, something by the class name, something by you know, tag name, and so on and so forth. So it's pretty uh, straightforward. To install this, to get it running, all you have to do is pip install Selenium, how, however you get your, your Python packages nowadays. right? And then you want to install the web driver for the specific browser that you want to interact with control. I'm going to recommend uh, Google Chrome only because Firefox requires something called a Gecko driver. and. Firefox has been churning out newer versions of, of itself quicker than the Gecko driver guys can actually update their drivers. So your experience is not going to be that great. So I highly recommend go with Chrome, and you're going to be pretty safe. right? Um, if you're on a Mac, you can just brew cask install Chrome driver. Um, but if you're on Linux, just, you know, I guess, yum install, DNF install, or whatever it is, the, the package that you use, the package managed system that you use. Um, here's something cool that I really liked about also using Python and Selenium is as you start doing UI automation, you probably don't know what to do. You probably don't know like what am I, what strategy am I going to use here, right? I don't even know what I'm trying to find. So I have an example here that is basically going to do two things. One, and if you were to run this in Python, it's going to be really quick. But um, it, it's going to basically open Google.com. Uh, it's going to assert that the title of the page says Google. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Google again. And now I'm going to modify Google's logo. I'm going to inject my own images in there. So this shows you that you can interact with the browser elements. And it also shows that you have a really powerful way to really inject anything into the page. So you know, it's really, really powerful. This screen here shows on the bottom, you have the code that I just showed you. I added a breakpoint. So um, if you were to, when you, uh, if you are to clone my repository, just mind that I'm using Python 3.7. So breakpoint is something that it's only available in Python 3.7. There are other ways to insert breakpoints. Uh, this breakpoint would not be found in the source code. So you're not going to have any trouble. But if you want to follow along, if you're watching the video later on, just be aware the breakpoint works only in 3.7. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to basically, I'm going to load this script on a Python REPL. I'm using something called IPython. And because of the breakpoint, you can see that I am at the line that says start Google Chrome. It says browser equals webdriver.chrome. So I'm just going to walk through it. And the reason why I want to do it is because I want to show you how um, you can interact and why this is a useful idea. Um, because if you're starting out doing web UI, it's a good idea for you to be able to interact with it and not have to write a script, run it, fail, try it again, fail again, run it. Right? You don't want to do that. So you can actually do this really um, interactively and slowly. So we're just going to hit the next thing. So here is opening Google. And then I am actually doing a couple of things. I am going to find the element. So I'm using element equals browser.findElementById. I pass the search box ID to it. And then because I am in the testing business, I want to make sure that I got my element back. And that's what the assert there is for. It says, please make sure that I found the thing that I want to interact with. If you don't find the thing that you're trying to interact with, then you won't be able to do anything with it, right? So that's the whole idea. So now, you know, we're going to type, um, you know, Red Hat into the search box. It's going to uh, perform the search, and that's the end of that that uh, part of the code. I'm going to browse to Google again. I am going to now. I'm going to make sure that I got my box. And now is where the fun begins, because I'm going to inject some code. And that's me. That's my picture. I just replaced it. It looks squashed, so I'm going to uh, change it so that it's, it looks a little bit better. right? But that's the whole idea. So interact with it. If you had more elements here, say you want to say uh, you want to search that you know the About link works, so you could actually do it right here, test it. When you get to the point where you think that you got everything that you needed, then you write the code, and you got your script. Right? So that's the whole idea. The last thing that you probably want to remember is that you want to quit. You want to close your browser right? so that it doesn't just, especially if you're running this locally, which I wouldn't recommend for a real scenario. You don't want to have like a million web browsers open on your, on your system. 
Okay. So that's the whole idea of using Python and Selenium. But you don't want to sit there and type all this stuff. You want to automate it. And that's where we start talking about uh, using uh, Python to write uh, your tests. The idea here is that you don't want to sit around and type stuff. You want to be able to have something that can be run, executed anytime you want, as many times as you want. Especially, I uh, would recommend that you want to do it through some kind of continuous integration environment, right? And what I have here is that, you know, because we already have all the, uh, uh, we have Selenium installed, we have a web drive installed. What I have here is what is referred to as unit test, Python unit tests uh, like tests. It, it relies on Python's built in unit test module. And the idea here is that you create a class for every, uh, it's a Python class uh, for every test that you want to run, right? So, like a test suite. I'm going to speed up really quickly because I got my 10 minute there. Uh, but basically, you can see a couple things I want to highlight. There's a setup here which takes care of creating the browser instance. And then there's a cleanup method which takes care of closing your browser. So, that's going to be very important. This is also referred to as a fixture uh, for your test. And that's something that you want to happen every time you run a test. Uh, there's some, um, a little, there's more control over this. So, you can have this happen for every test. It could be for uh, the entire module. It could be for the, cl uh, for the class itself. So there's some um, uh, ways that you can control. But the, the interesting thing here is that, that the first line there, line 11, line 12, takes care of creating the browser for you and closing it up. And then the rest of the code now is just basically, please open Google and assert things for me. right? So make sure that the first task, make sure that the title is present. The, the next one is, I'm going to type Red Hat in the search box. And then I want to make sure that Red Hat shows up in the, in the uh, title of the window itself. So this is the, the whole idea. Because we are, you know, I don't have a lot of a lot of time. I have the actual code here. This is how you actually run it. So if you clone again, if you clone the repository, you just run Python, put the entire path there, and you're going to see your browser start popping up and running things. And it's going to be really, really quick. Okay. So that's Python uh, unit test style. But uh, if you really want to learn uh, the coolest thing, the newest technology out there, if you really want to impress people and say, hey, I, I, I want to work as an automation person, a tester of Python, bless you. So I would recommend that you look into PyTest. And PyTest has a lot of really cool features. I'm not going to go through it right now because I don't have the time. But I will highlight that there are plugins, which are really, really cool. And then you have fixtures, which have really like fine grain control. You can really tell, like, um, you know, give it a name and you can specify when do you want the fixture to be applied. What should happen when, what should happen when you um, use uh, the fixture. There's some uh, cool things called parameterize, which lets you do uh, pass the data to your test. So you write test once and you change the data value and then it gives you uh, the, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the different uh, vari variations of the test, right? So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show you is I am in Installing a plugin called Python Selenium. And the reason why I chose to put that in here is because when you install Python Selenium like this, if you remember that the previous code I had to create my own setup and I had to say, please make sure to create my browser and then please shut it down, this plugin automatically gives you that fixture for free for all of your tests. Right? So the way that you tell your test which driver, which, uh, I guess, browser you want to use is by specifying the command line. So you say dash dash driver Chrome, and if you look at the code above, there's no setup, there's no teardown. I just wrote my test using just plain Python. There's no magic here. But there, the, the magic, I guess, there is, is this Selenium object here, right? This, this argument that's being passed to it. And this is the fixture that you get for free. There's no declaration. You don't need to import anything. It's automatically available for you, right? So I think this is really, really, really cool. Um, some other plugin that I have here. Uh, is xdist. And this allows you, imagine that you have like a thousand tests. You don't want to run your tests sequentially unless you have to. You want to parallelize it, right? You want to get your tests really quickly. So by installing this um, Python dash xdist, you can pass the and flag. And then you can specify, if you just pass, uh, pass uh, dash n auto, I think you will figure out how many cores are available in your system. And then we'll figure out like how many threads I'm going to spin up. And I'm going to split your tests, execute them in parallel, and then return all the test results back to you. Right? So that's really, really powerful here. Um, and that's why I wanted to show you that. You definitely want to play with, with this plugin. <coughs> then 
what I want to show you is that the next thing that I want to show you is there's something called sauce labs. I'm going to try to get back to it because I want to, if I run out of time, at least I want to get to the continuous integration part. And if I have time, I'll come back and I'll, I'll talk about sauce. If I don't have time, then if you want to ask me about sauce labs, just uh, ping me on, you know, outside of the room and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. But the final, I guess, piece of, um, of this presentation is about CI. So what's the use of, of you having written like a thousand automated tasks and they're just sitting there and it requires someone to automatically go in there and, and run something or click on something. But so the idea here is that you don't want to be bothered, right? You want to be drinking, you want to drink your coffee, you want to, you know, check the news online while your tests are being executed. That's really the truth. You don't want to be bothered with by anyone. So GitLab is just one free um, service out there. It's completely free, okay, that will give you a CI CD, so it's continue, continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, process environment that uh, it's completely free. And what I have here, when you look at the source code for this repository, you will see that there's a file called .gitlab .ci.yaml. And what I've done here, really to show what you can do, the power of CI, is that I created three stages. And these are the things that must be executed in a certain order. And for each stage that I have here, what I'm doing is I have different jobs that will be executed, right? So I have a generate docs, I have a test by test, and I have test sauce labs. And then, you know, for each stage, for each job, I have all the commands, uh, everything that I that I need to happen here. But the coolest thing is this. So um, some of these tests will require running my automated test, the ones that I showed you before, running on Chrome or running on Firefox. I don't want to run this on my system. Them. So using GitLab pipelines, what it does is it uses a Dockerized, and I hope you know, I don't know if you know if, how many of you are familiar with Docker, but you know, talking about containers and virtualization, right? So what it does is it will spin up a Dockerized Firefox and Chrome for you, and your tests will be executed against it. So there's no infrastructure that you required on your end, right? So that's really, really powerful that you have. I think that a picture would probably be a better way to represent here, but this is what, if you go to Git Labs and you look at the CI pipeline page, you'll see that the three stages. So what happens here is that this document that I'm using for this presentation is generated. There are some steps involved in the job. So I do some linting, which means I want to make sure that the restructure text syntax that I'm using is properly formatted. And if it's not, the job fails. I don't get my document. There's no new version of the document for me, right? But what I do is I generate the document. And assuming the document is actually finished and has no issues, it gets published to read the docs, which is that site that you see over there on the URL address bar. And then um, once that is done, I run my tests in parallel, right? So I run my tests on Chrome, I run my tests on Firefox. And assuming that these run, then I run my tests on Sauce Labs. How many more minutes do I have? You got three? Sweet. All right. So let me go back to Sauce Labs. So what is Sauce Labs? First of all, I work for Red Hat. I don't work for Sauce Labs, so I make no money out of this. I just want to make sure. Um, but I really, we use it internally. And the whole, the whole point of using Sauce Labs is that you don't want to host your own infrastructure. What if you are in the business of testing web UI uh, applications for phones, for devices, right? Or you have, you have a requirement that you have to, to support Microsoft, right? Are you going to have a Windows box laying around and install everything and maintain it and keep updating and whenever new versions of, of the browser come out. Um, I don't think you want to do that. Um, you could, but I wouldn't recommend it. So using the same exact things that I was using before, so using PyTest, using Python, using Python Selenium plugin, what I can do here is I can create my matrix of support, and that's what you see here. So I have uh, Chrome running on the Mac, a, a specific version of the Mac. I have Windows 10 and Microsoft Edge, I have Firefox on Linux, I have Safari on the Mac. And there's some um, magic here also that um, you will see that when you run the test itself, it does some really cool things. It gives it gives like specific names for the, the job so that you know, um, you know, like 
I got a little ahead of myself. Here's the test, right? So I only have two tests. My matrix has four different elements. So the outcome is that these two tests will be executed against those browser operating system combinations, right? So it will be a total of eight tests automated in the end for you. Uh, the way the PyTest works and when you use the, the XDIS plugin is that the name of the tests are not going to be, it's going to be all like garbage. You're not going to be able to tell which, which is which. So there's some really cool um, examples here on this um, uh, file that I, that I have here on the, on, on the repository that shows you how you can override the ID so you can give it a, like a name that makes a little more sense. So you can see, for example, that I'm running a test called test underscore page title in Chrome. Then the same one on Microsoft off edge, right? So, you know, th it is really cool to use Sauce Labs because you using their infrastructure, you're not pay well, we pay for it, but you're not paying for the, in terms of the, you know, like the sense of you have to maintain it, right? Because that that's time and money and people that it requires. And then Sauce Labs also let you, um, you can actually watch the video of the of the test, the recording of it, right? So you can uh, look. That's what you're seeing here on the screen. Um, for example, I actually have 50 VMs available to. Uh, um, to the projects that I work on. So I can have my tests running 50 uh, tests in parallel, which is a pretty powerful thing to have too, right? So I've been told that that's the end of my presentation. So there won't, and I, no time for questions. No, there's five, there's five, five minutes for questions? All right, cool. Yeah. So um, I hope this was useful. Like I said, please, if you, if you clone the repository, if you make any improvements, if you have any feedback, please let me know. Um, at the end of the schedule for DevConf, uh, you'll find a nice little link that says, hey, vote for this presentation. Tell Augie how awesome it was. So please do that uh, because then they will invite me back and I'd love to be back next year uh, here. So um, with that, I'll take any questions from anyone. Anyone? Yes. Question? Uh, for running uh, parallel tests, uh, when we write the tests, we have to write, in, write them in a way that they are thread safe, right? Correct. So the question. I've oh, been sorry. doing that in Java uh, using the thread safe thing, but I don't know whether there is some utility in Python for that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, I believe that the plugin will handle that. The question was running tests in parallel being thread safe, right? Um, I believe that the plugin will handle all of that for you, but I think the other factor that is important for you to keep in mind is that if you have a specific setup or teardown, let's just say, for example, that you, your tests require a database, right? So you don't want your tests relying on the same database if they're going to be changing the data. So that's something that you're going to have to to handle also. So not just just being thread safe, but also the, the content that you're going to use. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, question? Is there like a, re is there like a repo of uh, any like standard sample tests? Um, I may have missed it, but it's there. That's, that's a good question. Um, so yes, there is, but it's, it wouldn't be intuitive because, for example, I'm, I'm going to put a link here, and I hope that you have time to, to jot it down. But for example, um, I, work, I work at Red Hat, and we actually um, have all of our tests are fully open sourced. Okay, so you can actually go, if you look on github.com and you look for satellite QE, under satellite QE, you're going to find all the repositories, everything that we that we write for the automation that we um, execute at Red Hat. Robotello is something that I wrote um, 2011. It's still been around. But when you go to Robotello and then you look under the tests folder there, then um, there's some a couple of um, different folders. But this one over here, you can see, for example, like how do I do API tests? How do I do CLI tests? Um, so yes, there's there there are many repositories out there, but I don't think that there's anything that is like the definite source of truth for that. So you have to look around. So you can look at this, um, and you know, feel free to ping me, email me, um, and I'll, I'll point you to something interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. One more question, perhaps? Anyone? I'm preventing you from getting lunch. Yes. Yes. So you mentioned that the documentation is. 
You mentioned that the documentation is automated with the change of test. How do you, like for your stakeholders and just for legacy, like referring to it, how do you look at the history? Like, is there a way to, like, wh what does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, this specific document wouldn't, I guess, wouldn't match, I guess, the, the scenario that you pointed out because this is just for an example. But I would say that, you know, what you have to do is for anyone who would like to see what the changes were in, you will go to either GitHub or in this case, you go to GitLab and then you can look at the um, at the repository you can look at all the commits so this is where we're going to see the history of the changes that went in right and if you if you're in the business of writing documents right so then you probably submit your your changes and have someone review them before they get merged so they'll have a review process uh, before anything happens right so the pipeline is executed every time there's code changes here all right. Out of time. All right, cool. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.